over 30 centuries, tribal war cries have echoed across this rugged African land, once known as Abyssinia. Now it is called Ethiopia, land of the people with faces burned by the sun. Pagan monoliths recall the invasions of Semitic tribesmen from southern Arabia 700 years before Christ. Here in Aksum, descendants of Solomon and Sheba were crowned king of kings and set the future course of empire in Ethiopia. In 3,000 years, Ethiopia has endured in the vastness of northeastern Africa, a natural fortress protected from its enemies by mountains and deserts and unyielding traditions. Before the late 19th century, relatively few foreigners had penetrated its inaccessible borders. Lying just north of the equator, Ethiopia's 471,000 square miles supports a population of 25 million. With a terrain as varied as Africa itself, Ethiopia has never been fully mapped. An estimated 20 years will be required to survey and define Ethiopia's topography, which ranges from 381 feet below sea level to an elevation of 15,000 feet. The earliest known invaders came from southern Arabia. They were dark in skin, Caucasian in origin, speaking a Semitic language. Over the centuries, they conquered the native peoples of the highlands and secured the rule of Ethiopian kings. It was fierce warriors like these who turned back repeated invasions by Muslim armies, who kept the fertile highlands from being overrun by nomads from neighboring countries, who defeated the Italians at Adua in 1896 and kept Ethiopia from becoming another African colony. In celebration of their warrior past, horsemen of the Imperial Cavalry reenact a spectacle of warfare. It is called Paraskooks. After decades of war against Muslim invaders, Gondar became the capital of Ethiopia in 1636. Castles were constructed in a European style, perhaps influenced by the Portuguese, who aided Ethiopia against Islam. Gondar became a base of power. No longer would the emperors govern from battle tents and shifting campsites. 
In 1887, a new capital was established in the Central Highlands. It was named Addis Ababa, or New Flower. Today, Addis Ababa is a city of 700,000, a symbol of Ethiopia's belated entry into the modern world. Charles Sutton came to Addis Ababa as a member of the Peace Corps. He remained to form the Orchestra Ethiopia with composer Tesfaya Lenma. <laughs> Typical Ethiopian music is usually performed by one or two instruments. But the compositions of Tesfaya Lemma and other young composers are introducing new orchestral forms based on traditional themes. They compose for instruments that were known in biblical times. Their new songs are new sounds, even to many Ethiopian ears. Once a saintly monk wandering through Tigre province came to the foot of this lonely mesa. Legend has it that on top lived a large snake, and the Lord commanded it to stretch itself down and lift the monk to the heights. In gratitude to God, the monk founded the monastery of Debradamo, Ethiopia's oldest Christian community. In the 1400 years since the holy man's ascent, Entry into Debradamo has been made only with a leather rope. Not only is Debradamo a holy sanctuary, but a rock fortress that has withstood repeated assaults by foreign invaders. Only once in the 16th century were its natural defenses penetrated. Turkish troops fought their way to the first level. From there, a steep path led to the top, where every monk was put to the knife. <laughs> On special days, the monks trade for food from nearby villages. The food requirements of the monks are simple. For in its calendar of 13 months, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church marks 250 days for fasting. Only men are permitted on Debradamo. So strict is this observance that it applies even to males of animal species. Debradamo is distant from the world of ordinary men. The Ethiopian who enters its life must dedicate himself totally to the biblical God. He must leave behind all desires for worldly happiness. He has received little schooling beyond the mysteries of his faith. He knows suffering and self-denial and strives for the compassion of Christ toward his fellow man.
A monk has died. 82 years of his life were spent on Devradamo. More than likely, he came to this isolated mountaintop as a boy, perhaps as an orphan, or from a family too poor to keep him. In accordance with his vows, he fulfilled his Christian duties, and those who bore witness chant the Holy Mass. Today, Debra Damo belongs to the aged. Few novices come to accept its remote existence. In the death of a single monk may be the passing of a way of life. Harar is a Muslim city and capital of Ethiopia's largest province. Until the 1930s, it was a slave center. Arab traders from across the Red Sea bargained with local merchants for human lives. Now the slaves and their anguished cries are gone forever. <laughs> Basket weaving is taught to many Harari girls at home. Those with skill find jobs in small workshops that turn out household items. It may take as much as eight months to fashion a single masop, the special table used to serve Ethiopian food. North of Harar, sprawling deserts seem to defy human existence. Here live the Afars, nomadic tribesmen ruled by hereditary chieftains like Sultan Ali Mira. There are some 100,000 Afars in this semi-autonomous region of Ethiopia, governed by their own customs and the laws of Islam. Most Afars choose to retain their ancestral ways as herdsmen. Renowned as warriors, they face a new kind of attack. For the first time, the Afar desert lands along the Awash River are yielding cotton and other crops. Plow teams from another age are helping to extend the irrigation system. Each year, this newly developed desert area is invaded by more machines and men from the Ethiopian highlands. The Afars themselves stubbornly refuse to farm their lands. Working the soil, they say, is no task for warriors. And so the peaceful invasion from the highlands continues. Though the Afars may one day be outnumbered in their most productive region, for the moment, they show little concern. Like their ancestors, they continue to wander in the more remote wastelands. The Afars are held together by strong tribal tradition and by the power of the reigning sultan. Disputes among desert tribes are settled ordinarily by local chieftains. But whenever any decision is challenged, Ali Mira sits in final judgment. 
The trial proceeds according to Afar custom and Islamic law based on the sacred Quran. Once the evidence is given, the power to punish or to forgive rests with the Sultan. No Afar would dare challenge his verdict. <laughs> In the Afar game of Costo, the man served the ball must break away from his pursuers, with or without the help of his teammates. There was a time when Costo was so violent, it became necessary to ban further play. Now it is permitted again, in moderation. <laughs> For uncounted centuries, they waged war against their enemies and fought even among themselves for grazing land and water holes. Slaying an enemy was the Afar's way to manhood. It was better to die than to live without killing. Now a young Afar distinguishes himself by the songs and verses he creates. With these, he and his friends taunt their rivals. In Ethiopia live racial and religious groups whose origins are obscured by legend. The Falasha Jews link themselves to ancient Israel. Yet the sounds of the Hebrew language are new to the Falasha. Their religion is Judaic, but they are not regarded as Semitic. Rather, they are a native people converted many centuries ago. Young Falasha now study Amharic, the official language of Ethiopia, but their mode of living remains strongly Judaic. It grew out of the battles fought by the ancestors of these children against armies of the emperors and Muslims alike. Their prolonged struggles ensured the survival of the Falasha and their faith. In the village of Ambober near Gondar, it is the eve of Fasika, the traditional Passover. The annual cleansing of the synagogue is performed by priests and monks. Monastic life, common to Christian faith, was adopted long ago by the Falasha Jews. Married women mix dough for the ceremonial unleavened bread used in the Passover feast. It is baked on a clay griddle. Many Falasha beliefs are outside the body of Jewish faith. The Falasha do not observe all dietary laws. They know little of sacred lore beyond the Old Testament. And the Sabbath is a woman who intercedes with God for both the righteous and sinners. Passover is an eternal song to Jewish survival, a remembrance of the exodus of Moses and the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt. It is a story more than 3,000 years old, and many Falasha regard it as their very own. They believe that one of the Hebrew tribes struck south from Egypt and settled in Ethiopia. Chanting in Hebrew, the youngest schoolboy asks, why is this night different from all others? Few Falasha understand the language of the Old Testament, but the story of Passover is known to them all. On this night, 
the flight to freedom began. Away from Pharaoh's Egypt, away from the angel of death that brought destruction to the Egyptians, but passed over their houses. So quickly did the Jews depart, they were forced to bake their bread unleavened. To celebrate their escape, unleavened bread is eaten by Jews everywhere on Passover Eve. On May 5th, 1936, Ethiopia fell to a foreign power for the first time. Five tragic years passed before the country regained its independence from fascist Italy. Since that time, Liberation Day has become a national holiday. War veterans come to Addis Ababa to pay homage to the man who led them to victory and who has become synonymous with Ethiopia. His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, King of Kings, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, and emperor of Ethiopia since 1930. Emperor Haile Selassie has survived crises few modern leaders experience. The brutal conquest of his country was the most painful. When he appealed for help to the League of Nations, he spoke not only for Ethiopia, but for the integrity of all small nations. The world turned its back and drifted into a second world war. In Ethiopian life, the imperial ruler is likened in splendor to the sun, an exalted power to the lion, in his divine being to the kings of Israel, and at times to God himself. But the majesty of his office has not kept Haile Selassie from active leadership of his people. His will determines the policies to be followed by his ministers, by his successor, Crown Prince Asfa Wassen, and in some instances, even by the church. Emperor Haile Selassie is an absolute monarch, or as near as any in modern times. He has guided Ethiopia's destinies for over four decades with firm purpose. In large measure, each triumph, burden, or sorrow has been his. Ethiopia's bitter struggles to stay free from foreign domination are not forgotten, nor are its ancient military traditions. As the emperor passes, every veteran proudly proclaims his own bravery in battling for king and country. as the Ethiopian landscape are its people and cultures. The Gala came as invaders to the Konso region of southern Ethiopia two centuries ago. Here they found tribal rites which honor the dead with wooden statues and made them their own. During his lifetime, a Konso man will prepare statues for use upon his death. One is of himself, others of his family. These memorials are never set over his grave, but at some crossroad or landmark where passing tribesmen will remember him. There are 10 million Gala today divided into 200 tribes. Spread over half of Ethiopia, they represent the majority in the country's population. Their influence in national life has not been correspondingly significant. Mm -hmm. 
On nearby Lake Chavo, the people use a boat found only in this region of Ethiopia. It is called an ambach. Constructed of a light native wood, the ambach is so buoyant, it will stay afloat even with water flowing through it. Except for the Lenten season, fish is rarely eaten here, so the lake has retained its natural abundance of life. In these unspoiled waters, catfish grow to more than 50 pounds. There is an old saying in Africa that when the hyena approaches, the dog will run away. For no dog can stand up to the powerful jaws of a hyena. Searching for refuse or scraps, the hyena enters into villages and towns at night. He is the unfailing garbage man of Africa. <laughs> By daring to come into the towns, the hyena is not the coward he is often made out to be. A man in Harar proved this and turned it into an occupation. Along with hyenas have come occasional tourists to witness this attraction. But whether there are tourists or not, the hyena man must keep his nightly appointment or risk losing his performers and his livelihood. Night. The Omo River Forest is a haven for wildlife and home for the primitive Negro tribes of southwest Ethiopia. Here live the Bumi, skilled hunters who have formed a partnership with a group of outsiders. Together, they hunt one of Africa's most dangerous animals for skins and food. <laughs> Heading the operation is a Frenchman, Lucien Kadik. The Bumi tribesmen call him Lulu. Lulu has hunted in Africa for 20 years. He speaks only French. His associate, Giovanni Corvo, speaks Italian. Yet the two men understand each other perfectly. They are licensed to hunt a 50-mile stretch of the Omo with no limit on kills. Last season alone, they took the skins of 4,000 crocodiles. It can be argued that the crocodile is an ugly, distasteful creature, a treacherous killer. Yet it has survived on this earth more than three million years. Now man threatens its very existence.
The crocodiles of the Omo are among the largest in all Africa. The average adult grows to about 15 feet in length. In the course of a night's work, as many as 40 crocodiles are taken. Each kill is beached on a nearby bank, so as not to delay the hunt. A marker is set to make it easy to find. For centuries, the Bumi lived in almost total isolation. Now progress has come to the Omo in an operation whose ultimate goal is destruction. On the world market, the crocodile skins will bring over $80 a piece. To the Bumi, the skins have little value. They hunt the crocodile for one reason, its meat. Let him come! For the natives, these are good times. Before the foreigners came, they hunted the crocodile from flimsy dugouts. Now, from a single night's kill, there is enough meat to feed them for days. But the Bumi are paying a price. They have been forced to give up their village life to follow the professional hunters. Some believe the Bumi came to the Omo long ago to escape slave traders. Here they found shelter and a staple diet. It must have seemed then that the crocodile would last forever. Within a few years, they have helped bring the animal closer to extermination, and in so doing, may have brought about the end of their own way of life. The Simeon Mountains of the North Central Plateau are a sanctuary for two rare animal species found only in Ethiopia. A late starter in wildlife conservation, Ethiopia made no serious attempt to create game parks and reserves until recently. Now with the aid of foreign experts, work is in progress to establish boundaries for the new Simeon Mountains National Park. The Walya ibex is found nowhere else on earth. It was hunted by local villagers to the point of near extinction. Less than 200 remain. The gelada baboon are more numerous, never having been hunted in this region. Mainly vegetarian, they compete for food with domestic herds from surrounding villages. For this reason, villagers are being urged by the government to take their herds and leave their mountain homes. The task is not a simple one, for law and custom give them every right to remain. The district governor offers a chance for a better life with new lands on the lower plateaus. For over a year, the mountain men have resisted the offer. For now, the government will not press its case. But inevitably, ancestral lands will become park lands, and the shepherds of the high simians will be gone forever.
Since the fourth century, Ethiopian life has been dominated by a Christian faith as unyielding as its mountains and plateaus. During the 12th century, a pious king named Lalibela ruled from his mountain capital in northern Ethiopia. Gathering craftsmen from other lands, King Lalibela constructed a group of churches out of living rock. Four of them were actually sculpted from huge monoliths cut free from the surrounding rock. Once the outside dimensions had been shaped, workers chiseled out the interior. Whether they proceeded from the top through the windows or from the bottom through the door, no one knows. In several churches, it took 40 years to cut columns and arches from solid rock. Out of 11 churches inspired by King Lalibela, St. George's is perhaps the most unique. Cut in the form of a giant cross, it soars 40 feet out of the mass of rock in sublime unity with the earth. Older than its man-made monuments are the rituals of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church with influences of early Judaism and pagan worship. Church services express the faith that has come down through centuries, virtually unchanged. The liturgy is in the ancient Ethiopic language of Giz, and in a nation where illiteracy is high, ritual drama gives meaning to the written word. This is Thursday in the Holy Week that leads up to Easter. At the Church of the Savior in Adua, a special mass celebrates the act of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. According to St. John, when Jesus poured water on the feet of his disciples, he taught them an undying lesson in humility. And in turn, the church teaches this lesson to its followers. The following day is Good Friday. In Aksum, the holiest of places, the church is the keeper of the crowns of past emperors. The church alone is the confirmer of the king of kings, and nearly every Ethiopian emperor came to Aksum to be crowned. This close alliance with the imperial rulers extended the church's power. On this Good Friday, the imperial crowns are taken to the old church of St. Mary of Zion. The emperors of Ethiopia symbolically return to witness once again the passion of Christ. St. Mary of Zion, where only men may enter, is most sacred to Ethiopians. Legends tell of its destruction by Falasha and Muslim invaders coming 500 years apart. And on this sacred day, the blood of the past is remembered in the blood of Christ. Ancient Melikot horns announce the second day of Jesus' death. The church goes forth, asking rulers and ruled alike to have compassion and charity for each other. 
in the name and for the sake of the crucified Jesus. At sunset, the liturgy that leads to Easter will begin in the new Basilica of St. Mary's. The people have come to keep the holy vigil. They have fasted severely through Lent, and in the past 48 hours, most of them have taken no food. This privation has enabled them to share part of the agony of Christ. Now they await the glorious resurrection. But first, a ritual search for the body of Christ must be made. From out of darkness come the joyous words, Christ is risen. Let there be gladness, for there can be salvation for man. is broken. The Easter light spreads over Ethiopia, and the Spirit of Christ is reaffirmed. In Ethiopia, the hour of 6 a.m., not midnight, is counted as the start of a new day. More than being another method of telling time, it reflects the historical waywardness of 3,000 years in this isolated part of the world. Ethiopia remains mostly agricultural, with long-standing poverty and much illiteracy. Yet Ethiopia possesses sizable human and natural resources, with potentials more promising than in most countries of Africa. Slowly, these will be achieved, for the hours move on. The hands change, and a new day comes. 